Hi, my name is Anne Guy, and I'm going to be talking to you today about what helps and what can hinder if you are psychologically supporting somebody who is thinking about or actually withdrawing from psychiatric drugs. So let me just share my screen with you. So let's just start off by understanding, well, who's behind the guidance? Uh, it's a predominantly UK based um, initiative in terms of the content and the authors. Um, and it was facilitated. So it was, all the people were brought together um, by the all party parliamentary group for prescribed drug dependence. Um, and as um, I think has already been mentioned, I'm the secretariat coordinator for that group. Now we approached the leading um, professional bodies for psychological therapists in the UK, um, and they agreed to participate and fund um, the creation of this guidance, recognising the need for their members to actually have this information. The Council for Evidence-Based Psychiatry, um, I'm a member of that, so is James Davies and Luke Montague, who are also involved in this um, guidance. Um, we led the project. Um, the principal authors were drawn from, not specifically drawn from, from CEP, just a lot of them happened to be members of CEP. And CEP is also the copyright owner for the guidance. We also have some additional, uh, additional endorsers, um, the National Counselling Society, the International Institute for Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, which I think many of you might be aware of, and um, a support group in the UK called Let's Talk Withdrawal. So the editors, myself, James, and Professor Rosemary Risk, um, the evidence on the drug effects were contributed by Joanna Moncrief and Tom Stockman. And the implications for practice section, we basically asked the leaders in the field for each of the major modalities or ways of working in psychological therapy to participate. Um, plus Professor Tim Bond, who is the acknowledged thought leader when it comes to working ethically um, in therapy. And um, we were also, really privileged to have a couple of experts by experience be part of the group um, who helped define and shape um, the contents for about, well, what are the implications for practice um, in working with this information once you know it? And just going back up, so evidence on withdrawal and how to actually support that. Um, so from Professor John Reed, James, uh, myself and Belessa Frederick, Be Belessa Frid Frederick, who many of you might have heard of. Uh, very again, very grateful for her allowing us to draw on her years and years worth of uh, ex very valuable experience. So, what I'm going to cover today, and I'm very conscious that this guidance has been created specifically with psychological therapists in mind. That's who it's been written for, and I'm not going to. Um, you know, hide that. Um, however, an awful lot of this information is very relevant to anybody who finds themselves in a support role uh, for somebody who is considering or actually withdrawing from psychiatric drugs. Um, so I'll do my best to kind of highlight where, they, where the material is very specifically about therapists, but it's probably going to be fairly, fairly self-evident. So I appreciate that a lot of you will know an awful lot about this subject, but um, I'm just going to establish some very broad definitions that I'm working with. So at least you understand the frame that I'm coming from. Um, so what is withdrawal? When can it happen? How common is it? How long might it last? How does it manifest? How might we see it? How well is it understood? And I'm going to spend more time talking about the three stages of supporting withdrawal. There's also, how do we integrate this into our practice, into our work? What's the preparation we need to do for ourselves as practitioners? Um, and how do we actually build this into the way that we work? 
And lastly, a bit and I'm hoping you might help spread the word uh, in terms of the availability of this guidance. So let's dive right on into some definitions. So dependence on a drug is when somebody takes a medicine or drug, and I, I tend to use the word drug throughout uh, following Joanna Moncrief's um, example, really about highlighting that um, th these um, drugs are not acting on a known disease mechanism, they're not acting as a medicine, so um, that, that's the term terminology that we adopted. Um, so when somebody takes that, prescribed or not, the body views it as a foreign um, substance and tries to counteract its effects by adapting to it. So the, the body becomes dependent on it being present. Over time, <clears throat> higher doses might be needed to achieve the same effect. So you reach tolerance of a drug. Now, this is very distinct to uh, addiction, which um, is really dependence plus a compulsive preoccupation to seek and take a substance despite the consequences. And it's, it's really important that we understand the distinction between dependence and addiction um, because they're very, very different um, in both personal experience and how we interact with somebody, depending on what their experience is. So withdrawal. When the drug is stopped or reduced, the adaptations that the body has created to the presence of the drug are no longer opposed by the drug's presence, and that can lead to unpleasant sensations and experiences that are called withdrawal. Now, the term withdrawal actually refers to both the process of coming off and the reactions to reducing or stopping a drug. So when can withdrawal happen? So very obviously, um, when somebody stops taking a drug completely, um, often referred to as going cold turkey. So you might hear something like, um, I tried to stop taking them, but I felt bad again, so I went back on them. It's the kind of thing you might hear in the room as a therapist. When somebody misses a dose, again, you might hear, I really notice when I miss taking a dose, I must really need them. Again, people not understanding what that might be. Even between doses, when somebody's reached tolerance for a particular drug, it's possible they might experience some withdrawal reactions between their doses. When changing drugs, now that's particularly common. Um, when somebody has been put on a drug initially, maybe the side effects um, or um, our adverse effects are troublesome and they go back to their prescriber and they just get moved on to a different drug. Um, and this can happen at all sorts of points, particularly accessing uh, medical care when becoming an inpatient um, or, or seeing a new prescriber. There can be a review of drugs um, and drugs stopped or started. Now, less common, um, some people notice that when they change the brand of the same drug, um, that they can experience some effects. How common is withdrawal? So the evidence, the latest evidence says that at least half of people suffer from withdrawal reactions when trying to come off antidepressants and half of those will experience severe reactions. And I have included some references at the end of um, my slides um, and I'm hoping they'll be available to you um, afterwards. How long might withdrawal last? Well, this is the very much the piece of string um, answer, but reports range from, um, it's interesting, from two weeks to months or even years. Of course, withdrawal reactions can occur within hours um, of actually stopping um, taking um, a drug. But in terms of how long the reactions actually last, um, it is this very um, indeterminate length of time. And they can also be experienced in waves. And then there might be windows where there is um, relief from experiencing any, but then they might come back. And often, of course, that's very um, closely aligned with somebody's um, withdrawal schedule. 
that, you know, when you come step down a dose, then you experience reactions, but it's, it's very different. It's very individual experience. So how does withdrawal manifest? What does it look like? And more importantly, in therapy, what does it sound like? So some of the most common withdrawal responses include sweating, nausea, dizziness, abdominal cramps, flu-like symptoms, anxiety, agitation, insomnia. In terms of the kinds of things we might hear about in a therapy room, very obvious things. Mood changes, tingling, electric shock type feelings, a high, an increased risk of epilepsy panic attacks, poor memory, hallucinations, delusions, and nightmares. And in the guidance for psychological therapists, we include uh, a table which summarizes the most well-known or most well-recognized withdrawal effects because the list is very, very long of the range of experiences that people have reported. And that's organized by drug class and tries to separate out the effects of taking the drug versus the withdrawal effects. In terms of how well withdrawal is understood, well, we know, as we've established, that they're caused, reactions are caused by the removal of the drug from the body, but they can be mistaken as signs of the return of an original problem, physical or emotional, and that's also gets called relapse, or a new problem. And again, physical or emotional. And in research um, done into people's experience who are withdrawing, um, it's unfortunately really common that people get sent for all sorts of tests, uh, unnecessary tests, um, as to what might be causing um, a whole range of symptoms without the most likely cause actually being adequately considered. So an awful lot of um, worry and anxiety that people are being put through um, potentially unnecessary, unnecessarily. And also, of course, expense to the system. But I, I guess I'm more concerned about people suffering. Hmm? So when somebody is going through withdrawal, the first assumption should be that any new reaction is related to that process. And we're gonna talk in a little bit more detail about how do we help somebody understand what's within their normal repertoire for them uh, of emotions and how might they identify um, reactions that are associated with withdrawal. This is probably the, one of the biggest points that to be made today is that it's vital to locate the cause of any withdrawal problems with the drug and not the person. So a huge element of the guidance is aimed at not psychologizing something that's fundamentally physiological. And an awful lot of people have ended up not trusting their doctors because their response has been to assume that any problem arising is with them as a person and maybe they've had a complicated um, history of different emotional reactions uh, and everything gets seen through that lens rather than looking at the wider picture of what's actually happening around um, their taking or withdrawing from um, their prescribed drugs. So why do psychological therapists need to know about psychiatric drugs? Now, that might seem self-evident, but actually it, it was a, a specific part of training in the UK that psychological therapists did not need to know about psychiatric drugs and, in fact, should not talk about them, that it was beyond their remit and that there was a danger that they might be stepping in on the toes of medics if they were to discuss that kind of material. However, we know um, from a Public Health England review done in, it was published in 2019, that 25% of the English adult population were prescribed a psychiatric drug 
in 2016 to 17, and the figure has only increased since then. A survey of therapists in 2018 showed that over 96% of therapists who responded to the survey are working with at least one client taking such drugs. And I think um, it, it, it's inevitable, given the work that we do and the um, uh, frequency of prescribing, that that's going to be the case. So, the, and the other reason that we need to know about them is not only because they're prevalent and they're out there and our clients are actually taking them, but the taking of psychiatric drugs by the client and or the therapist can impact the therapeutic process in several ways. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about that today, but there's a lot more in the guidance on um, how the taking of psychiatric drugs might impact therapy itself. Because of the previous training environment in which we were, and I'm saying we because it was in part of my training and part of what I picked up, was that you, you don't go near this subject, is that we wanted to give psychological therapists specific permission, actually beyond permission, actually saying that we should be engaging in these conversations when appropriate to the client, to the modality, to the setting always subject to the frame of therapy, um, but that it is very much part of our responsibility to our clients because we are in a unique position sometimes to hear when withdrawal might be going on. And if we don't know about it, if we haven't educated ourselves, there is an unfortunate possibility that we might inadvertently compound harm being done. So this, this particular client group, and I'm using the word client, I appreciate some of you might use the word patient, um, but they're not misusing drugs. And this is really important. And it goes back to this distinction between dependence and addiction. They've taken drugs as prescribed and found themselves dependent on them. Difficulties with prescribed drug dependence have been under acknowledged um, that's a, you know clearly a major understatement and withdrawal reactions are commonly as we've already noted not recognized by prescribers and instead often mis mistaken for relapse and unfortunately people end up being reinstated on drugs um, believing that well I tried coming off them I felt worse I've got to be taking them for life and some people have specifically been told that they're going to need to be on them for life This group of clients, their need for psychological support and specialist services has historically not been recognised. And this is a huge part of the remit of the all party parliamentary group for prescribed drug dependencies. We are doing our best to influence the creation of services in the UK uh, to actually support people going through this process. Now, one hugely liberating distinction that we talk about in the guidance is the one between giving information and giving advice. Now, therapists generally would steer clear of advice anyway, but it's particularly helpful to understand the difference in the context of medical information and medical advice, because it's this fault line which created the kind of rather risk averse response of just don't say anything. But we wanted to be very clear about where are the lines between what you can say and really what you should avoid saying. So we can share information from a reputable source. We share information amongst ourselves and friends and family. You know, it's just a human activity to do that. I appreciate we're talking about a very specific context of therapy, but psychoeducation, call it what you like, sharing information, absolutely fine. Discussing the evidence to help somebody understand what might be their experience. Again, part of what we do as therapists um, all the time and understanding how um, 
people react to adverse circumstances, how they adapt to it and how those adaptations um, are impacting their life. This is really just another dimension of that. We can offer a different perspective, holding open the space for different options, key part of any therapeutic conversation. So what we don't do, we don't offer a diagnosis. We don't prescribe drugs. We don't advise on dosage and frequency. We might give general information about the principles of safe withdrawal, but we don't give any personal information or personal advice on dosage and frequency. So the whole idea of personal advice on how to withdraw. You, you, what I tend to do, and I've ended up with quite a lot of clients coming to me, I think inevitably because I've been involved in this area now for a number of years, uh, people seek me out specifically to talk to me about um, their experience of withdrawal. Um, and I'm just always really clear that I'm not a medic. Yeah, I might have a doctor in my title, but I'm not a medical doctor. Um, I can't give that personal information. And we always talk about, well, who who is giving you the personal information? Where are you getting that from? What is a reputable source for that? So information sharing about drugs. We can highlight the availability of certain types of information and signpost that information from trusted sources. You can dis give and discuss information from your own reading of those sources. It's all based on encouraging the client's own agency, their own ability to make decisions for themselves, to look at information in order to enable deeper conversations with their prescribers and then make informed decisions. So let's move on to have a look at the three stages of support that I mentioned. And I'm going to spend a little time in here because how we help somebody. So stage one is to prepare. Stage two is about what can we do during withdrawal and stage three, not surprisingly, what happens afterwards or what can be done afterwards. Now, we don't always have the luxury of starting a relationship with somebody when they are before they've actually started their withdrawal journey. Um, so some of what we're talking about in preparation, we might need to come back to, we might need to draw on, even if somebody's actually already started their journey, if it's the start of your relationship with them. So not surprisingly, exploring somebody's readiness to begin a withdrawal journey, particularly what do they know and what do they believe? about the drugs that they are taking. Now, this is hugely important in terms of how they understand the drugs to be working, the benefits or adverse effects they ascribe to the drugs, what's been their specific experience of taking the drugs. How have they helped? How have they hindered them? It's really important to understand that because those beliefs and that knowledge will inevitably colour their experience of coming off those drugs. And it's equally important to ensure that there is, as far as possible, a balanced view of what's going on so that there isn't, um, we're not, we don't go into black and white thinking, you know, that all drugs are bad or all drugs are good. It's so, it's so individual, it's so personal, it depends on the drug depends on the person. So that's one other thing just to say is that the guidance is not anti-drug. It's not saying that they're never appropriate. It's just only in very specific circumstances and they're a lot rarer uh, than we are currently led to believe. Another important area to explore and understand is somebody's previous experiences of trying to reduce or stop. And I think, you know, this these points are universal, regardless of the kind of relationship or kind of practitioner you are, um, to understand somebody's previous experience of what they might fear, um, how, what kind of things they experienced, the range of reactions they had, 
um, if any, they might have had none and um, on previous occasions and be blithely unaware of what might happen. And this is this is important to understand the specific fears, um, because this is the fear about the process, the fear about fears about um, what they might experience, fears about how friends and family might react to their coming off their drug, um, and also fears about, well, who am I without taking these, particularly when people have been taking them for years and years and years. Um, it might be, they might be about to embark on their first experience of themselves as an adult unmediated by drugs. Now that can be huge. So, you know, this, these are important to understand the very specific context of the person in front of you. We've already talked about signposting relevant information, but particularly around the importance of slow tapering and also understanding, well, who's going to support managing your taper? What's your relationship like with your prescriber? And there unfortunately have been a, um, a very large amount of people who experienced real disruption to their relationships with their prescriber and found themselves on the outside of the healthcare system. Um, and they're incredibly um, cautious um, about any kind of interactions with the medical system, afraid that um, they may be put, up, put back on drugs against their, against their wishes. So discussing the possibility and the nature of withdrawal effects is, is hugely important. A um, lot, lot of information in the guidance about um, the withdrawal effects that we've talked about. And this isn't about scaring people. This is simply about helping people understand the range of possibilities of what they might experience. Discussing the difference to relapse and to agree the approach that you're going to take. Now, this, this is, again, a very large subject for each individual because you need to understand their emotional repertoire, both pre and post taking drugs, or help them check in with, well, what are the kinds of things I experienced before taking, being prescribed the drugs? How have the drugs changed that? And if they've been taking them for many years, recognizing that they might not know what's their normal without the drugs because they haven't experienced it for so long. So it's kind of establishing that landscape going into the withdrawal so that you can helpfully identify potentially um, responses that are likely to be withdrawal responses rather than any kind of um, re-emergence of an initial problem or the, their, their normal self reasserting itself. Actually, um, it's really important to kind of benchmark where you're starting so that you can agree that approach to new or heightened emotions. So you're going to agree that you're not going to react to every response as if it's about them as an individual. Um, and we're going to come on to actually what the assumption should be about that in a minute. Okay, so carrying on thinking about how we can help somebody prepare. And actually, this is a joint preparation, because if you're accompanying somebody on their journey, this is work you're doing together. Um, it's the equivalent of making sure you've got all the right kit and if you're heading off on a long hike, um, making sure you, you're adequately um, dressed and um, have all the resources available that are available to you. And, and that, that's this next point, really. Identifying support networks, and that's in terms of their personal network, their friends and family, who's going to be on side, who's going to be potentially sabotaging or critical. The professional network. So this is not only the prescriber, it might include you as a therapist or in whatever capacity you're working with somebody to support them. And it might just think be about, well, who's available to them? So they might not already be in a professional relationship with somebody, but who is available should, should they actually need it? 
And a hugely important um, element of support, the support network available to people is the peer network um, that has grown up online in direct response to the lack of recognition and availability of services for this issue in healthcare systems around the world. And uh, we know how fantastic some of those resources truly are. But actually identifying what's available locally to your client um, is really helpful. So they're not having to then do that work if they're in the midst of actually some difficult withdrawal responses. Not everybody's cup of tea, but discuss the idea of using a diary or a log to track reductions and their reactions. Um, there are some examples of um, these in, in the back of the guidance. Um, again, it suits some people and not others to do that. Very helpful to be very clear about the availability of extra sessions or other contact if, if it's needed. Um, just being clear about the limits of what you can offer and hence the importance of if you're not available, well, who might be in that moment? So during withdrawal itself, as we've already talked about, helping to identify withdrawal reactions and normalizing them. So it's checking in, what's been the most, what, what, what's your client patient experiencing? How is it different to previous experiences? How intense are those feelings? Any concerns, any fears that they might have about those feelings and what they might mean? Checking in, well, yep, yeah, that kind of thing. Is it, is it on the, the list of common, common reactions? And just noticing, actually, most helpfully, how close the reaction is, as the experience of it has been to a recent drop. Now, it's not always indicative. Um, of it being a withdrawal reaction because they can set in, they can arise actually quite a long time after um, a reduction, but it's usually a pretty good indication if it's close to a reduction. Very important, we support our client, our patient's agency, their own right to make decisions about their body, to go at their own pace, whilst they continue to draw on medical advice or the generally available information that you might have signposted them to. Um, and this is always, I mean, all of this is done um, with the best interests of the client in mind. Now, this is a point very specifically for psychological therapists that we may need to actually suspend work on deeper psychological material during periods when withdrawal reactions are strong. Um, and we're simply in support mode because if somebody is experiencing a range of emotional responses, we can't expect to differentiate clearly um, what might be caused by what. Um, and also, we don't want to um, unleash or release anything new. Um, in psychological material whilst they're going through this process. Actually, they want to be, you want to be as in a stable, stable state as possible before beginning. Um, providing support, now that might be, look quite different to what a psychological therapist might normally do. And there are a range of potential useful practices um, mentioned in the guidance, a little bit of information and links to deeper information to help manage experiences. Now, we don't have to be experts in all of these. We don't have to know, we don't have to be able to teach mindfulness or yoga or whatever the um, supportive practice is, but helping the client identify the kind of thing that they think might be useful to them, where to find out information, what have they discussed with peers, what's been useful to them in the past. It's the kind of standard fare of therapy, really, in terms of um, helping identify options and supporting a client's decision-making process as to what they might do about it. And above all, and I think everybody understands this about psychological therapy, the key thing we offer is our relationship. 
Um, we are continuing to provide that warm and attentive therapeutic presence. Um, we are listening, we're validating, we're um, doing our best to help help using the uh, asking the client to help us understand their experience and being alongside them on their journey. And as the withdrawal journey progresses, we slowly are starting to help an adjustment to a non-drug mediated self. And when people have been taking drugs for many years, they don't know what to expect as to what's going to be normal for them, what's going to be their new normal. And it might take a long time, actually, for that to become obvious. So after withdrawal is complete, um, and actually there, there might be some debate over when you can say that is true. So obviously there can be the, I've taken my last dose, um, but obviously withdrawal reactions can occur for some time afterwards. Um, and in some cases, quite a long time afterwards. Now that's rarer, but it does happen. And so um, it's something always to remain aware of as a possibility. But depending on somebody's experience of withdrawal, if they've if they've had any cognitive problems as part of their withdrawal experience, it might take a little while for their confidence in decision making to come back. So it's kind of with the client kind of assessing what have they been left with. To really help ensure that their aims for. Um, and assessment of their progress are realistic. Um, and also to think about, well, is, is there any further work in therapy to do? And particularly if a client's withdrawal has been experienced as traumatic, this might need to be considered in further therapeutic work. Hopefully, if you've been able to um, establish a relationship and been able to help somebody prepare and move through their process, hopefully it will be less traumatic um, than it might otherwise have been. But obviously it depends on the range of um, responses that they've experienced. Yeah, post-withdrawal reactions obviously can occur for some time after stopping. Um, and that's important for both us as therapists and the client particularly to be aware of. So I'm just going to move on to consider some general points about working with withdrawal in practice. So any intervention always is subject to the frame of therapy in the best interests of the client. And if you're not a therapist and you're a medic or working in some other kind of uh, caring capacity with somebody, it's always subject to the frame of the service you work in or your profession. You have to decide what's right for you and your practice, but discuss that with the client. And I think this is where it inevitably is a very personal and highly contextual um, intervention. Because we are often in a unique position to hear possible signs of dependence and withdrawal, um, it's vital that we educate ourselves kind of at the very least, but I'll come on to kind of the, the different levels of engagement you might choose in your practice. But just being alert to the possibility of withdrawal and being willing to flag it could prevent or reduce a very large amount of suffering for clients. So just coming on to thinking about those levels of engagement. One of the most basic is to understand your own beliefs about psychiatric drugs, to educate yourself on the evidence and to become aware of the possibilities. And the guidance ethos is about bringing together the best available current evidence on this subject. So once you've understood your own beliefs and what you're bringing into the room, about psychiatric drugs and you've got your information and you understand a bit about how withdrawal can occur and what it might sound like, you can listen more deeply to your client's experiences 
and hear more about how drugs might be coming through their, the way that they're talking about themselves and their world. So you're moving beyond informing yourself and listening into something more active. Because you're aware of the possibility of withdrawal, do you feel able to flag it? Can you find ways of gently introducing the possibility that something might be about withdrawal? Beyond just raising the possibility, we're moving into information sharing about how drugs work, possible effects, how to withdraw safely. Work out your reputable sources that you might draw upon. And maybe the, 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 the deeper level is actually being able to support a client through withdrawal. But having gone through the three stages, it's not, it's not particularly difficult. And I think any, it's really about having the information and understanding about what might be going on. And that's exactly what the guidance is intended to deliver. Um, so I'd originally gone looking for a fact sheet that I'm, I assumed must be available from my professional body. And when it wasn't, raised the possibility of actually creating something. But the guidance we've created, there's the short version and then there's the full version. That's enough. It is enough to actually enable you to support a client through withdrawal. And of course, as with any subject, it's about gaining confidence um, in your ability to do so. But it's by doing that you will obviously acquire the confidence. So just a couple of client examples. Um, obviously, theoretical. My boyfriend says I must really need the pills. He can tell if I've forgotten to take them. Now, I have actually heard somebody say something very similar to this. So how might we respond? Well, what is it that he notices? When you've listened to what it is that he's noticed, gently raise the idea of, well, I wondered, I wonder if you've considered the possibility that what you experience is the effect of not taking the medication, a mini withdrawal, rather than an underlying problem or version of you showing through. The effects of missing a dose or stopping taking these drugs is only now being more commonly recognised. Very gentle introduction of just an alternative explanation uh, based on evidence that might save a client. Just that little exchange might completely alter somebody's understanding of their experience. And mean that when the time comes that it's right for them to consider stopping the drug, they're already aware of some possibility. So another example might be um, towards perhaps the end of uh, a therapeutic um, relationship. I'm feeling so much better. I've decided to stop taking my medication. Well, you, you would normally explore um, what does taking better, uh, feeling better look like and feel like, and you'd explore that. But then just to, again, gentle inquiry, um, I wonder what your plan is for coming off. Sometimes people aren't aware that it needs to be done very slowly to avoid experiencing withdrawal reactions. Have you had a chance to discuss it with your prescriber? Now this, I'm afraid, is quite a common response. Um, I've certainly heard it on more than one occasion. Um, yes, they've suggested I take one every other day. Now, this is the territory as to why many therapists um, have been scared to have these kind of discussions with clients because if they're afraid of being seen to tread on a medic's toes. So how do we deal with this very, very common uh, potential scenario? This is the kind of thing I might say. So, as you know, I'm not a medic and I can't give you medical advice, but I can highlight relevant information. And there is evidence that for some people doing that, i.e. taking a pill every other day, can lead to triggering withdrawal reactions and that a slow, smooth reduction can be more successful. I can let you have some links to some information if you'd like to look into that. And 
a very uh, helpful um, um, document produced by the Royal College of Psychiatrists with the help of Dr. Mark Horowitz um, is um, their leaflet about coming off antidepressants. Now, this is a brilliant resource to pass on to um, clients uh, for them to take to their GP. And it, it couldn't come from a more reputable source. And then gently thinking about, well, how might it feel to go back to your prescriber to discuss it again? And some people find it very difficult to, um, it's not really a challenge, but it's it's basically saying, I found out a bit, a bit about this and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this to, to, a, to a medic. And encouraging and exploring any resistance to doing that might be really helpful to um, ensure that the prescriber relationship they have is going to be a productive and helpful one during their withdrawal journey. So how are we going to reflect this in your how do how do we think about reflecting it in our practice? Well, decide what kind of interventions you might make, taking into account your way of working, your setting, and that's going to be very different for everybody. Uh, any intervention, and um, you know, I can't stress this isn't prescriptive um, guidelines; it is guidance, um, and it's up to you to decide what's right. Uh, and it's always subject to the frame of therapy and the needs of the client. Might be helpful just to think through, well, who am I working with? Where are each of them in relation to prescribed psychiatric drugs? Do I know what they're taking? Might there be any issues to take to supervision to explore? That might be particularly, and again, as I say, there's more information in the guidance on this. If you fear that the drugs they are taking might be inhibiting potentially the process of therapy itself, you could consider any areas for further reading you might like to do. And probably not a surprise, there's quite a long list of potential uh, additional reading in the guidance. Really important, update your client facing information to say you are aware of issues of prescribed drug dependence and withdrawal. If you're in the UK, if you're a member of one of the professional bodies, and you have a profile on their site, there is now a little box you can check that says that you are aware of these issues. And this will enable clients to find you. Please, if you feel able, do update your information to say that you are aware of these issues. And perhaps consider raising the topic with your supervision group or a training group or peers as a potential topic for CPD, for continuing professional development. And we have various um, recordings of presentations and uh, other training um, events that are available on the prescribedrug.info website. Um, and potentially I'm also, also available to talk to groups in the UK or online, I'll talk to anywhere if you don't mind it being in English. Um, get in contact with me via the site. So could you help spread the word about the guidance? So the English versions have been downloaded over 22,000 times now. Um, both the full and the short guide versions are available to read online for free. Um, and PCSS, PCCS books also sell a hard copy of the full version, but that's a cost price. They're not making any profit on that. We do have some um, versions in different languages. The full guidance is available in Spanish. There's a short guide version in Italian, and there are several other in progress. And if anybody happened to be interested in doing a translation, please do contact me via the website. We're very interested in hearing from anybody who might be willing to do a translation. There are additional training materials under development specifically looking at materials to support uh, undergraduate and postgraduate trainings in the UK. And all the resources um, that I've talked about and the training resources will be available for free uh, via the prescribed drug website. So now I'll be very happy to um, take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much for listening.